Let's be honest with one another. Teslas, Taycans, those are for rich people. But the world's a-changing because now the huddled masses like you and I, we too can have EVs. We've driven the Hyundai, we've driven the Kia. Now it's time to try the 800-pound gorilla, the Toyota. You guys know I love me some automotive porn, and this is beyond automotive porn. We've got literally everything. We've got two electric motors, batteries, so a lot to dive into. First, up front. Remember, this is technically really a front-wheel drive car that has an all-wheel drive option. So in the front-wheel drive, that is 150 kilowatts, which translates to 201 horsepower and 196 pound-feet of torque. But let's say we have situations like this. We're driving the all-wheel drive limited, which has the back motor. That changes the motors. So up front, it's 80 kilowatts. In back, it's 80 kilowatts, which translates to 107 horsepower front, 107 horsepower in the back, 214 total system horsepower. In terms of torque, that translates to 124 front, 124 back, which is 248 together. Now here's where we get to the confusing part. There are two different battery sizes on offer, whether it's front wheel drive or all wheel drive. The front wheel drive is 74.4 kilowatt hours. The all wheel drive, the one we're driving today, 72.8 kilowatt hours. Why the difference? I went and spoke to one of the engineers behind the project. Turns out the guy is Brazilian, very cool guy. Uh, there were not enough batteries that could be supplied from one supplier for both vehicles. So they had to go to two different suppliers to ensure enough supply of batteries for both the all-wheel drive and the front-wheel drive. While we're talking about the battery, two other things here. There is an enclosure that does heat and cool the batteries, so there is an HVAC system there. And then second, the onboard charger. Believe it or not, it's actually kind of slow. I'm kind of surprised Toyota did this. A lot of the EVs you and I have been driving as of late, the onboard charging system is all the way up to 11 kilowatts. This 6.6 .6 kilowatts, which is kind of like yesterday's speeds. Now, in terms of the overall electric architecture, no, it's not like the Taycan and the Hyundai. At 800 volts, this is 350 volts. Now, in terms of ratings, what does the government say about this? In the front wheel drive, XLE, meaning the lightest or the cheapest vehicle, that's 252 miles of range according to the U.S. government. The one we are driving that has the fancy motor in the back, that goes all the way down to 222 miles. Now, believe it or not, I do have one performance figure for you, and that is 0 to 60 on the front wheel drive, 7.1 seconds. This all-wheel drive, a fire-breathing 6.5. It's electric, so of course it's heavy, 4,464 pounds, or depending on express your weights and measures, 2,025 kilograms. Now, if this were not the fancy limited and it didn't have the second motor, it would be 198 pounds less. With that, oh, that's good. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but it's not trying to be the fastest thing in the world. As a matter of fact, driving around where these things are indeed intended to live. And there it does deliver adequate power. I believe we're at an inflection point when it comes to EVs, at least in terms of delivery of power. They don't necessarily need to be rocket ships anymore because traditional OEMs are now bringing these things out in the masses. As such, it delivers power similar to that of a, of a conventional ICE. So think acceleration similar to that of like a Rogue or a RAV4, but because it's EV and you have instantaneous torque, it is a quicker, it's a more immediate experience. So a huge point you and I need to discuss while we're driving the vehicle, and that's the wheelbase here. One of the big benefits of electric vehicles is different packaging. Technically, you don't even need this or that back there. It could be a big blob, but really what Toyota did here was extend out the wheelbase. Here, it's six inches longer than that of a wheelbase of like a Nissan Rogue or a Toyota RAV4. Why is that important? Well, one can package more people and more dogs here. Like for example, I'm six foot. That is all the way back, that seat there. And look, I still have some knee room. In other words, you're not gonna torture your friends and family when you put them back there or your dogs, because Kumo and I, we've talked about this. He's 65 pounds, he needs more wheelbase. Now this is where we get back to our ongoing discussion of personalities and vehicles that have EV propulsion systems. So if you've seen our Ionic 5, Kia EV6, or even Porsche Taycan episodes, those stand out because they have a personality first and then they're an electric vehicle. This, it's 
kind of in between. There really isn't a personality here, at least in acceleration. But then we get into driving dynamics, and there are a couple of things stand out. But first, a recap of what's underneath the propulsion system. Struts up front, multi-link in the rear with a stabilizer bar. The brakes up front, 12.9 inch diameter rotors. The brakes in the rear, 12.5 inch diameter rotors. That all kind of works together to, the best way to put this, it's a substantial driving experience. It doesn't feel like a RAV4 or a Rogue. It feels like something more substantial. Is it like, European in feel? No. Is it luxury feel? No. There just isn't a personality other than substantial, meaning you're feeling the weight. Now, as part of that, there are two things we need to discuss. First, the steering. There, it's moderate. There's no feedback. It's not the most direct steering in the world, but then again, it's something you really wouldn't expect in a vehicle that's a crossover. Here, I'd like to have a little bit more weight in the steering to kind of match the substantial feel of the vehicle. And then there are the brakes. And here, I'm kind of surprised. Toyota has been very good over the years of putting some more brake feeling into the stopping experience of their hybrids because at the end of the day they have a huge amount of electrified vehicles you don't think of toyota and full electrics granted they had what 1997 and 2011 they had that rav4 electric but that was only in certain parts of the country but their experience comes from the hybrids and i've got to say they've done a good job like you drive a lexus hybrid and you have good pedal feel here i think more tuning needs to be done to get the brakes to feel like those other their Toyota products. Granted, this is kind of their first rodeo when it comes to full electric in terms of a 50-state car, so I kind of give them a pass in stereo. It's not like an on-off switch, but it needs a little bit more brake feel so it doesn't have that EV golf cart feel to the braking. So putting all of that aside, how does it work on its intended mission, which is to exist in sort of fancy neighborhoods like this? And there, it does an unusually good job. I'd say a significantly better job in drivability. Like, it's a little bit more fun to drive than a RAV4 or a Rogue or anything like that. There's good acceleration, works together with some prudent choices of suspension hardware down there. Like, they could have went with some sort of non-independent suspension in the rear and the front-wheel drive model, but even in the front-wheel drive model, it's got the multi-link, and as such, it delivers a ride quality that's a little bit batting above its station in life. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game, Mind the Options Game, with today's contestant, the first ever Toyota fully electric vehicle on offer in all 50 states. This one, the BZ4X. Beyond Zero for, I guess, crossover. There's a whole language to it. You and I are not going to cover this. What we are going to cover is the base price of this one, the very fancy one, the limited all-wheel drive. Wow, $48,780. But that is not the cheapest one on offer. There is an XLE without the motor in the back, meaning front-wheel drive. That one is a paltry $42,000. Then we get into the color of this vehicle. There are two things going on here. Number one, the paint. Notice that is red. It is very pretty. The other colors on offer, white, gray, black, not interesting. This is interesting, especially when you add the two-tone roof. So this is $425. Want the black roof? $500. And while we're on the roof, notice the spoiler there. It's kind of like a tiered spoiler. It's actually kind of interesting. And I guess it would work considering this vehicle is all-wheel drive and has propulsion in the back. So you would want to get some more traction between your tires here. So that's why you want the spoiler. That is an additional $500. Then the JBL stereo system in here. Uh, not enough base, could use some more, but still $580. Then the all-weather package. Now, granted, this is all-wheel drive, but you absolutely need to have heated seats in the back when the vehicle already comes with heated and vented seats in the front. That is an additional $500. The only other thing we add is the destination and handling. Von uh, Japan, I believe, $1,215 for a total retail price of $52,000. What was I saying about the huddled masses? 
So you and I already did a deep dive on the interior and the design and the tech review when this thing first came out. But now being our first opportunity to drive what will most likely turn up in a dealer, let's discuss a couple of things. Number one, the tactile feel. Overall, it's good. It ain't great. There are some pieces here, especially on the top of the dash, like way out there, as well as on some of the door panels. Um, I don't know what's going on here, but it's not up to the usual Toyota quality. I'm going to give a caveat here. This is a pre-production prototype, so my hope is this will be better in the cars that turn up at dealers. Uh, number two, all of the basic ones, the XLEs, any color you want as long as it's black on the inside. In the limiteds, which this is, you could do the black or it could be like a lighter, almost like white gray color. Maybe a tan would have been a better choice. Uh, then something that's unusual now that I'm driving it, didn't notice it back in the tech review, the seating position specifically as it relates to the instrument binnacle. So remember we discussed this being kind of like a 928, when you move the steering wheel, it goes up and down, but it's the whole column, not just the steering wheel. But they pushed the instrument binnacle all the way forward, and now that I've spent some time driving this thing, the sensation is one of you look over the steering wheel to see the gauges. I don't know if I like it or don't like it. It's different. It takes some getting used to. Like when you first get behind the wheel, you're like, oh my God, I'm adjusting the steering wheel the wrong way. You almost want to put it down in your lap, but then you realize the steering wheel, it's a very small diameter steering wheel, even smaller than some of those like performance steering wheels that Porsche has on offer in like Boxsters and 911s. It's, it's unique. I think this is one of those things that comes down to personal preference. Everything else is unusually good in here. Like, for example, they all come with a panoramic roof, which kind of floods the interior with light. And that's important in a vehicle that has a lot of dark surfaces. Then there's the screen. We spent a lot of time talking about this in Tundra and Lexus NX episodes. Here, it's a little bit different in that you don't have a knob. Instead, you have a toggle switch for temperature, fan, and the direction of the air, which I kind of like. I'd love to see a regular old like volume knob, but here it's still a hard button, so I'm gonna give them a pass on that. That in turn brings us to one more interesting point. The dashboard, it's covered in cloth, and they're very nice touch because it makes the overall interior feel a bit better, but I would argue it's a missed opportunity. Notice it's kind of like a check pattern, almost like Pepita Houndstooth from a Porsche. There it's muted, it's gray and black. What they should have done is like a white and black, have more contrast and have that theme go through the entire interior, like on the door panels and on the centers of the seats. And there it would really stand out and give this thing some personality on the inside. That said, I believe the reason they didn't do that, if you look at this thing, very much of a futuristic interior, that is whether you like it or not, open to interpretation. So let's sum this up with a bit of a real world story that happened behind the scenes here. So all the B-roll you saw in this episode that Scott and I captured, uh, we did that in one of the neighborhoods around Carlsbad, California. And while we were capturing that, one of the neighbors came out very curious, like, what is that? Turns out he's a Tesla Model 3 owner. He looks at this thing and says, not only does he like it, he thinks it's beautiful. And he pointed out specifically that this car has a screen in front of the steering wheel and said the Tesla is not safe because there's only one screen over here. So adding real world feedback, this is the kind of person that Toyota is trying to go after with this vehicle. The fact that they think it's pretty, forget what I think, I think it's a little too futuristic, but the fact that a Tesla Model 3 owner thinks this is interesting says a lot about what it'll do in the market. Now adding on top of that, the way this drives, I expected more of a personality. That's where we get into the wish list. I'm gonna ask for two things here. Number one, perhaps tuning it a bit where it has more of a personality like the Hyundai or the Kia. Because remember, the Kia was more of a sporty version of the same platform of a luxury car that was the Hyundai. That's the only thing this is missing. And the second aspect of the wish list, like the Hyundai and the Kia, this, it's five grand too expensive. If any, regular traditional OEM is looking for regular people to adopt EVs. Yeah, infrastructure is a big deal, but when the cars are 50 grand, that's just too much. They need to go a little bit lower 
to get widespread adoption. This is just one man's opinion, and this is where I turn this around to you to opine in the comments below, or via our social media, Motoman TV All Word, Motoman TV All Word, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And with that, a little bit more behind the scenes, this is the very same location that this car was introduced back last fall. We usually go to different places when they introduce cars, and then when they drive the cars, this was such a unique spot right on the Pacific Ocean in Carlsbad, California. We decided to come back. Until we see you in the next episode, bis später.